everything is learning. It's not just this training course or that e-learning course that any time that you, you open your mind to a new way of thinking or a new way of solving a problem, that's learning. Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, an exploration of the idea of curiosity and its increasing importance for thriving in the digital age from the authors of The Curious Advantage. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Curious Advantage podcast. This series is about how individuals and organizations use the power of curiosity to drive success in their lives and businesses, especially in the context of our new digital reality. It brings to life the latest understanding from neuroscience, anthropology, history, business and behaviorism about curiosity and makes these useful for everyone. My name is Simon Brown. I'm one of the co-authors of the book, The Curious Advantage. And today I'm here with my co-authors, Garrick Jones. Hello. And Paul Ashcroft. Hi. And we're delighted to be joined by Pame Basse. Pame is an entrepreneur, executive, world traveler, educator, writer, comedian, and philosopher. Uh, her day job is as chief learning and diversity officer for the Kraft Heinz company, where she creates a culture of continuous learning and drives the company's global learning and development strategy and initiatives through Ownersity, which we'll hear about later, Kraft's uh, Heinz Corporate University. Uh, Pame has deep expertise in learning theories derived from artificial intelligence research and practical experience designing and developing highly rated learning solutions and transformative professional development programs. Uh, prior to her joining Kraft Heinz, she served as the global head of learning platform and professional development for BlackRock, uh, the world's largest asset management company. And she was previously president of the Pame Group, an e-learning design and strategy company. Uh, alongside her day job, uh, Pame is Chief Experience Officer of the My 52 Weeks of Worship project, uh, through which she facilitates courageous conversations about cultural and interfaith diversity, inclusion and understanding. Uh, this informed her 2018 TEDx talk, uh, Navigating Sacred Spaces, and also her book, My 52 Weeks of Worship, Lessons from a Global Spiritual Interfaith Journey. Uh, Pame serves as chair of the National Advisory Board of the Haas Centre for Public Service at Stanford University and is past co-president of the Stanford National Black Alumni Association. Uh, she earned a bachelor's degree in symbolic systems from Stanford with an artificial intelligence concentration and a master's in computer science from Northwestern. She's also a graduate of the Second City Conservatory program in Chicago and an advanced study of improvisational comedy and theatre. Uh, it's an honor to welcome you to the Curious Advantage podcast, Pame. Thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, I'm excited to be here. Oh, thank you. So what an impressive background. Um, to kick off, I'd love to understand your journey to CLO or Chief Learning and Diversity Officer at Kraft Heinz from studying AI at Stanford University. Can you take us on that journey? I can. It has been quite a journey. Um, and I, I'm one who, who likes to say that you look in your rearview mirror and it all seems like it makes sense. But at the time, you're just kind of making the next best choice based on interests and, and opportunities. Um, I started um, as a techie, as we call it at Stanford. I studied um, symbolic systems, which was a combination of the study of a number of different disciplines, computer science, philosophy, psychology, linguistics, and logic. Um, many other organizations or universities may call it something like cognitive science. I was interested in AI from a very young age, and so that was my concentration. And I thought as I was, you know, studying that I would be a software designer or a software developer, mm -hmm. or I would be in a, you know, somewhere in part of an effort to create intelligent computers. But I found a program at Northwestern University that was run by AI researchers, and it was sponsored by Accenture. And okay. the proposition there was, well, we know from AI research how the mind works and how people process information and how you we learn, let's use that information to create more engaging learning environments. And because, of course, it was sponsored by um, Accenture, the the, the, the uh, audience was corporate learning, uh, corporations mm -hmm. rather. So back in the day, I call um, when there was lots of funding and lots of attention, we were creating 40-hour simulations, immersive business simulations at a time where we weren't all staring at our computers all day like we are now. And certainly 40 hours would not happen here. Now we're talking about micro and nano learning. Um, but that was the beginning of my career in, in learning and development. I called myself 
um, a software developer for a long time because I was doing mostly ed tech. We were doing learning um, software, e-learning when e-learning became a thing. And not to make me sound like I'm 140 years old, but that's the trajectory. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then you know because I went to school in Silicon Valley, I thought after a couple of years in consulting, I should be doing something more more innovative. And so I went to a startup, which was based in Chicago. So I didn't go back to the Bay Area. It was a mobile technology startup. And I was doing a lot of interface design for uh, mobile phones, voice user interfaces, a lot of technology that's not in any way near where we are now, but kind of the 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 predecessors to our smartphones and our series, et cetera. That company uh-huh. died very quickly. We had not enough customers because I think it was just before its time. And that's when I did two things. I started my own company, um, an e-learning design and development strategy company, and I studied sec- at Second City. So I thought, you know, I have a love of comedy. I'll study improv. I'll start my own company. And those were the two paths that led me down um, further into a career in learning and development. Um, after about 13 years being self-employed, I went back into corporate, as you mentioned, first to BlackRock in New York, and then found my way to Kraft Heinz. And so that's how, that's the whole journey from really being a a big nerd, and I still am a nerd, and I wear that badge proudly, um, studying AI (laughs) when people weren't really talking about it all the time like we are now, to uh, being at at Kraft Heinz. Fantastic. Um, I didn't realize you had the Accenture connection as well, so we, we both have that in common. And also, all of us on the podcast, interestingly, have founded learning co- companies. So uh, mine was Brightway back in 2000, uh, you with the Pame Group and, and Paul and Garrick with Ludic. So how did you find having your own company actually helped you with transitioning to large corporates? Because I know that was a very interesting experience, certainly personally, going from a, a, a small startup situation to a, a large corporate learning environment. Absolutely. And I like, you know, when I was at BlackRock, I called myself an entrepreneur just to give myself a bridge. How am I going to figure out how to be innovative um, and think the same way that I might have thought when I was the one making the decisions? I mean, I mean, we talk about curiosity. And I think when you are um, running your own shop, you have to always be asking questions about how, I mean, in my case, it was consulting primarily, how you can uh, solve problems how you can serve your, your, your customers or your clients. And so there's no way I don't think to be an entrepreneur or run a company without being curious and being a little bit, you know, bold. And uh, if you aren't fearless, at least pretending like you are so that you can move forward and and continue to generate revenue and continue to build and and stay in great work, which really was my, was my goal. And all of those things are useful um, in the walls of a corporation, especially if you work for a company that really is looking to learn and grow and be curious and, and creative in the way that you develop people. So those are some of the, the, uh, the connections that I was able to make. Pamela, I love that you've got straight into curiosity. Uh, could you share some of the stories of the great work you've been doing with um, your associates at Kraft Heinz developing their curiosity? Absolutely. And when people ask me what I what I do, as, as Simon mentioned, I say my one of my jobs is to drive a culture of continuous learning, bold creativity and intellectual curiosity. Um, and, you know, I have been in learning and development in so many different ways, certainly creating courses and programs um, and and those sorts of things are the bread and butter or have been. But the idea of creating a learning culture was really important to me when I walked in the door and I said, okay, first of all, I'm, you know, I'm inheriting this, uh, our corporate university, which we call own university. It's based on one of our values. We own it, but there was still a little bit of a culture of kind of compliance and not necessarily of looking at um, learning as a privilege and not kind of as a thing that needed to be checked off. And so I very quickly decided that I was going to model what it looked like to be a lifelong learner, um, to be curious, to um, to be creative in the way that I that I went from I asked myself the question, what do I need to know to be great in this role, and where do I need to go to get it? Um, and I think we'll talk about my my project, my 365 days of learning, but really saying I want to learn something new every day and share it with the organization. And as a new CLO, I think for for uh, you know, a couple of months, people were just kind of thinking, what is she doing? We had an internal app called the Catch App. Um, of course, of course, we work at, I work at Kraft Heinz that I was sharing, right? <laughs> what else would we call it? Oh, the Catch the App. Catch I'm just app. Not, yeah. no, I'm just... <laughs> it's happening. Yes. I love it. Every time I say it, I, I just, I smile. Um, so modeling curiosity and then bringing people along on the journey. And so it's been um, a fundamental part of the learning culture as it's evolved at our company. 
I don't, don't know if you've been through a, a similar journey to me, but um, I came to realize maybe in the last year or two that I was missing an enormous part of my own perception around learning, which is the culture piece that you described. So I spent many years you know, involved in learning in, in many different capacities, and I'd never really given enough credit to creating that learning culture that it, it can either make or break all the other great work that is done in learning if there's a culture where, they, where people embrace it, or whether there's a culture where people feel they don't have the time to be able to commit to learning or don't prioritize learning. Uh, I'd love to, love to just hear a little bit more on how you've developed the culture within Craft Heinz because uh, it's, it's something certainly I, I missed in the past as to the importance of it. Right. I mean, I think that anyone who's been in learning for any amount of time knows that there's it's never fun to to beg people to complete courses or to berate them into <laughs> completing courses and I'm sending emails yep. and people are deleting them or I'm needing to chase and send a thousand emails so that people can create a, co- a complete one course. And so that was one of the things I definitely have no love for. And so being able to, from the very beginning, show that first of all, everything is learning. It's not just this training course or that e-learning course that any time that you you open your mind to a new way of thinking or a new way of solving a problem, that's learning. And certainly that is important, especially if you are a company that's growing and learning and transforming as our company was. And so, you know, being very clear that as I was every day learning something new, re- t- listening to a podcast or reading an article and sharing a summary or going to an in-person learning event or a conference, et cetera, really showing a everything counts. And B, you don't, it does, five minutes, 10 minutes, I became very good at finding articles from various, uh, uh, Harvard Business Review is a favorite of mine because I can read one in 15 minutes and then share a new perspective, really showing people that learning doesn't need to take hours and hours and hours. And once I started doing it, that was, that was nice. And then I got, you know, kind of the first follower. And I don't know if you've seen the video of the dancing guy on the side of the mountain and the whole idea of how you create a movement. You need one lone nut, which was me. And then you need one follower, two followers, and everybody kind of says, hey, what's going on over there? And so I was lucky in that I just, I followed that exact kind of formula. And by the end of the first year of my, what I call my 365 days of learning, we launched an uh, organization-wide um, campaign called Learn Like an Owner and had 500 employees sign up. And then in 2020, the next year, we doubled that. And this year, we've increased further in the CEO and the chief people officer and, and you know leaders at the top of the house. So it's really a grassroots kind of starting with one person saying, hey, we're going to be learners and this is how we're going to do it. And then inspiring others to, uh, to, uh, to join. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's so much, so many things I want to ask you about. I mean, you've studied symbolic systems, which I definitely want to ask you about. And you, you've you also, you know, you're into AI. I'd love to talk about the future of learning and AI. And then you also, um, you know, you've done improv and you come from Chicago and Chicago, well, you're in Chicago now. And Chicago is one of my favorite cities. And I was first exposed to improv in Chicago because it was a huge kind of thing going on from 20, 25 years ago. I don't know if it still is, but all of these amazing things. Um, And you also role modeling learning. You committed to doing, learning something new every day for a whole year. Can you share more about what that was and what were some of the things you learned and what did you get out of, you know, it's a little bit like performance art. (laughs) Some of these, uh, you know, Marina Abramovich or some of these artists who really do solid, very long commitment to things over a long period of time, it has impact and um, creates things. And I'm interested in what your experience was and what you got out of that 365 days. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, I'd say at the beginning, it was humbling because, you know, I was a brand new CLO and I, and, and I could have just been making career limiting choices by doing random learning and posting and what is she doing and why isn't she focusing on the work? Um, But to me, it was the work. And so, I mean, certainly I learned how to search um, our corporate university. Uh, You you know, as a learning professional, you want to tell people, we have these resources, you should use them, they're good. But if you don't actually really know if they're good, then you kind of feel like, well, I don't know, maybe they're good. I don't even know what's in there. I'll just keep saying, go in there. And so first, wanting to make sure that I knew what what resources we were offering to our learners what their learner experience was. If it took 47 clicks to get to an e-learning course, well, you know what? No one's going in there. 
no one has the patience for that. And so certainly my um, head of governance, technology and operations who, you know, drives the, the evolution of our ecosystem, I would just say to her, hey, this is this is broken. Fix that. Why does this work this way? Um, why can't people get here quicker? Uh, and so certainly I learned about our learning ecosystem and how to make it better. But every day as a professional, you have challenges. If I had a difficult conversation, I would search for an article on how to have a different difficult conversation. If I was trying to figure out how to walk through our new performance management system or learn the business. I mean, I came from finance to food. What do I know about marketing and operations and, <laughs> you know, and making food, et cetera? So I really embraced the whole thought that I can learn my way through a new role first for myself and then to show other people like this is how you do it. And so that's kind of how I was thinking about it. And how did you show other people? I mean, because it's it's an amazing personal project, but role modeling it to your colleagues around you, how did they become aware that you were doing this? So, you know, the learning is one thing, but the sharing and the reflecting is certainly as important, if not as uh, more important. So the Catch app was literally a social media platform. And so, you know, 60, 70% of our organization had it on their phones. It was used for announcements and that sort of thing. So I literally posted two hashtags, learn like an owner and make time for learning. And every day I would post learn like an owner day one. This is what I did 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. This is what I learned. I, along the way, I was like, Hey, can we link to the, to our platform? And so our technology improved along the way. And when I tell you, I was posting with no in an echo chamber of silence for a good hundred days. That's exactly what was happening, and I'm That's sure. Amazing. And actually, I had a, my first follower said, "Hey, I joined you because I was like, what is she? I mean, maybe she needs a friend. Like, what's going on? <laughs> she's new to the company, right? She's sticking her neck out there, and maybe I should help her." Sweet. But once she did that, then somebody else did, and then more people did, and then people liked and commented. So the movement played out on that kind of the social media platform on our catch up. Um, and continues to grow. Brilliant. Yeah, it so uh, it is very much like you described that lone nut video of yeah, da dancing alone in the middle of the field, and eventually someone comes and joins, and then more joins and, and more joins. I, I love the the hashtag make time for learning because um, that's certainly something seen within Navas where we have the the aspiration of a hundred hours of yes. learning a year, um, and one of the the big challenges is is finding the time to be able to do that. So, uh, what progress did you make with that? How did people react to that making time for learning? I would love to hear more around that. Sure. And, you know, I'm three years in and I still, it's still difficult for me to make time. Uh, not necessarily, I'm learning all the time, but the sharing, the posting to say, hey, this is what I learned. This is what I'm, how I'm giving back to kind of the culture. So in a visible way is, is, is difficult. And so you have kind of a couple camps. You have some camps, we have learning ambassadors who embrace it completely. They also learn and share in these, you know, these digital shared spaces. And then we still have the conversation of people saying we should have dedicated time. Some regions, our team in, in, in Australia and New Zealand have done a learning hour, et cetera. I still hear every day, well, how can we make sure that we're creating protected time? So, you know, it's not magical, right? You have, I now have, you know, a percentage of our employees who are in the movement, they're totally committed. And I still have people saying, I'd love to do that, but I don't have time. So it is an ongoing challenge. Um, but, you know, I'm up for it and I'll continue talking about it. And I and, and it's lovely to see people who have said that their lives and their careers have been um, changed because they have been curious. They've made that time for learning in the face of what seems like our busy lives. Nobody has time to do anything. You're listening to The Curious Advantage podcast, inspired by the book The Curious Advantage. Written by Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrick Jones. Subscribe to the podcast today. Tell me, how, how else has your focus on creating a movement in learning impacted the organization more broadly? So you've talked a bit about how it's impacted individuals and how it's impacted perhaps the culture. Have you seen some shifts in how people work, behave, interact with each other, perform even what are some of the impacts that you've seen? One of the things I love is after the first year we had um, we had those top learners come together um, for a uh, co-located learning experience. Um, we called them the learning ambassadors. It was a learn like an owner retreat, 
And it was 30 folks from around the world who are all so excited and from all parts of the organization. So not necessarily just the top of the house or senior leaders, some were, you know, analysts brand new to the organization. And someone said, what I love about this is there's a culture of generosity that's forming. And I thought, oh, that's amazing because I can read an article and I could say, this is nothing to do with me, but isn't Simon working on this problem about how to, you know, make sure X, Y, or Z is happening? Let me send this to Simon. So my team members are sending me articles. My CEO is sending me articles. Like we are sharing the things that we're learning. And that culture is the foundation for some of the work that's happening now. We're, we're a company that had a new enterprise strategy rolled out last fall by our new CEO who, who joined just after myself. Um, and we're talking like most companies are about what capabilities are necessary. How do we develop those capabilities? What skills are necessary, et cetera? Much easier to do that when people are talking about learning and they have, you know, you want to call it a growth mindset. I like to call it learn like an owner, the ownership of learning and development and believing that, hey, I can learn my way through this. If my if I need to pivot in my role, I can learn my way through that. If I need to figure out how to do something more effectively or more efficiently, I can reach out for learning. And so I think it's permeating the culture, especially as we are a company that is transforming um, from a business perspective and changing and growing and, um, and, and headed towards the goals and the targets that are set out in our enterprise strategy. I love that. And I, and I love that it started from learning and that you're, cu you're cultivating a spirit of generosity and then from generosity sharing and then how that sharing goes out into right out into the organization. That's a, that's a very nice sentiment. Yeah. And we talk about the power of we. So certainly I'm just happy to contribute to my peers, the leaders in the functions, marketing and sales and innovation and procurement and ops, supporting the work that they need to do and the, the work that employees need to do to, to, to drive the strategy. So, uh, you know, it is me alongside my peers and my colleagues, and that's just a wonderful place to be. It's very interesting. You're coming from the Kraft company. For example, Kraft took over the Cadbury company some years ago in, in Britain, and it caused a bit of a kerfuffle, as we say, because Cadbury's was so much a kind of a British brand. And one of the reasons why it sort of struck a chord or hit a nerve was because Cadbury's um, was set up by the Quaker movement in the um, 1800s and had a very sort of highly principled, almost utopian kind of background. And they'd, the, the Quakers who'd set up the factories had wanted to create chocolate <laughs> for everybody, but they also wanted to create utopian workspaces and they built villages, one called Bourneville, which still exists. And they were part of a movement which was really trying to reinvent the world, very principled and with, with values. It's interesting hearing you talk because I'm hearing principles and values in everything you you say. And you talked about your 365 days of learning. And I know that that connected to another project you had, which you've mentioned, which was 52 weeks of worship. And that informed your book and it informed your TED talk, which is fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit more about your 52 weeks of worship project? Absolutely. And first I have to say, you know, I've been at Kraft Heinz for three years. I did not know about the Quaker Cadbury craft connection. So thank you for it's teaching beautiful. me something new. I will send you some I'll stuff. Have to, uh, yeah, I'll have to, you know, go down that rabbit hole of learning. And another thing you said that's amazing is that, you know, any good leader knows what drives you, what your what your core is, what your values are. We last year at Kraft Heinz rolled out our new um, or refreshed values so that everybody knows our, our purpose. Let's make life delicious. Everybody was reminded of our values, et cetera. Mm. So, um, you know, any leadership development program starts with, well, what do you believe and how can you make sure you, you align your purpose with your company's purpose, ideally? Um, in the Quakers, I did spend time with the Quakers. So for the past um, 10 years, I have been you know, I have a passion project that sits side by side with my work in L&D called the My 52 Weeks of Worship Project. And it started in 2010 when I decided that I'd visit a different place of worship every week for a year. So churches and mosques and synagogues and temples and traveled. It was not an academic exercise. I just followed my, you know, interests. So from the south side of Chicago to South Africa, from Brazil to Brooklyn, and it was an intensely personal project because the year before that, I'd had a very challenging year and lost my father and my grandmother. Uh, 
And I learned so much about the many ways that people gather, what people believe, how they search for the divine. I went to my first Quaker service and I thought, we're just going to, it's so quiet here. It was, it was a really interesting experience. Mm. Um, I got invited to a Quaker wedding and I thought, well, what's the, how's that going to be? I didn't actually go. I should have gone. It could have been an interesting experience. But for me, it was very personal and me trying to figure out what I believed and how to stand in my own power so that, and so that I could most importantly respect fully other people who believed other things, which I think is something that we're all going through in an amplified status based on what's going on in the world. Mm. I am, as Simon mentioned, chief learning and diversity officer now. And so it's kind of interesting how uh, my personal and professional passions are merging in many ways. And that that whole thought that in order to really embrace diversity and be an inclusive leader, you have to A, know who you are and what you stand for and what, what you believe and become very comfortable respecting other people who believe something completely different oh or my. have different lived experiences. And yeah. Yeah. It takes practice. And I got, a, I had a lot of that. Uh, this is so, right at the heart of what we believe about curiosity in two of our seven C's. One is, one is about context. And if you've got to learn about religions, why not explore 52 different types of religion every week for a year? There's you know, going to generate some context. And the other one we have is our one about critical thinking, which is about keeping your unconscious bias in check and being able to reflect and understand the diversity that is around and ask curious questions as a leader. Um, it's absolutely fascinating to me that in your own journey, uh, you know, you've gone very wide first and then figured out for yourself where you stand and, and what you want to do, which is astonishing. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you discovered about the sacred and, and sacred spaces in our contemporary world? Yeah, sure. You know, and again, now that we have all been kind of sequestered in our various home spaces and had to, you know, gather virtually that the idea of a sacred space is even more poignant, right? I don't necessarily need to be co-located in a place that looks like a, a traditional place of worship. I can make a space sacred based on my intentions, based on my rituals, based on my routines, based on me deciding that this is a place where I'm going to go deep inside and learn about myself and how I want to show up in the world, et cetera. And I really, I mean, I'm, I actually feel very blessed that at the time I was able to walk into people's really special spaces and just be a visitor and said, you know, and there were some times where they weren't even speaking English. And I was, I was, I said, you know what, don't change what you're doing. I'm just going to absorb the energy here. I'm just going to observe and that sort of thing. And to your point about context, when you are a visitor in somebody's space or somebody's life, or you're trying to interact with somebody so different than yourself, it's an amazing practice to say, you know what, I'm just going to be quiet and listen to what you have to say to me. That's so what cool. you're, what you, what's coming out of the words that are coming out of your work, that the experiences you've had, and I'm going to be humble hmm. and I'm going to let what I learn change who I am, change the way I lead, et cetera. And those spaces where you are learning and growing in that way, I do believe are sacred. Certainly I could go down and talk a uh, rabbit hole and talk to you about theology and worship and religion. It's another love of mine. But mm. if you take those lessons and bubble them up into a corporate space is mm. how can I see you and your superpowers and what you believe and how you contribute and respect that and figure out a way to, to engage with you respectfully. That's very moving. Yeah. Pam, I wanted to ask you a question. I think you, you're possibly one of the few people in the world that would, would have the context to answer this question, but you, got, you have a background in artificial intelligence um, and computer science, but also sacred spaces. So my question is, as we more and more now live and inhabit these virtual and digital worlds, where are the sacred spaces here? And um, what are the implications of that, do you think? I think that... We as humans, and I still believe this, and I'm sure there's an AI scientist or researcher out here will say, no, she's wrong, um, are unique in our humanity, right? And so you can talk about artificial intelligence or you can talk about augmented intelligence where we are allowing technology to do the tasks that we didn't really want to do or are not so great at anyway. Um, like we think about machine learning and, you know, so much data and doing that analysis so quickly, more quickly than perhaps a human could do, leaving us to do the things that require empathy 
or require us to, to stand in our humanity, to interact with other humans. I do think we have to protect that because, you know, as we learned this year, it, you know, it's nice to be able to see you through the screen, but it's also nice to be able to stay and be in a space with you when we can be human to human. So I think that being intentional about protecting and nurturing sacred spaces where we can interact with each other in only the way that humans can and being creative and innovative about using technology to do the things that don't really require humanity. Um, we still have to create them, right? Technology, thankfully, at this point mm. cannot create itself. We're writing the rules. We're creating the algorithms. We're doing all of those things. And so I think it's really being thoughtful about how to ethically say, let computers do that. We're going to do this and we're going to protect the spaces where mm. humanity is necessary, where we, where we do our best work as humans. And you really touched me, actually, and, and made me think about um, it's how we are with people, even in the digital realm, even now, how we are listening, how we recognize them, how we recognize the stuff that we don't see or allow that to be present, which in some ways is sacred. And I, I haven't thought about that before, and I thank you for that. That's given me a lot to think about. I, I want to ask, if you combine the attitude of faith and also what you know about symbolic systems, how are these how are these relevant these days what what i loved about studying symbolic systems was really looking at a challenge or a thought or a a set of information from different perspectives right some may think someone who's a computer scientist and someone who's a philosopher were like what are they going to talk about <laughs> right but certainly any time you're trying to make sense of the world there are symbols involved Right. Anytime you're trying to put together, I loved linguistics, the ways yeah. that we we work to communicate with each other and how languages evolve and how some people are purists and they say this is language. And some people are saying, hey, you know what? It's evolved so that we can communicate with each other in a completely different way. That's still language. Mm. And so I think in the same way that faith and as a woman of faith, I say you're trying to make sense and order out of what you perhaps can't see, what perhaps um, seems um, to be kind of ephemeral, like what what am I actually, what, the core of who I am or what I believe. Mm. There are so many ways that people try to make sense of the world, whether it's philosophers, whether I'm a coder, whether I'm a linguist, whether I'm putting together pieces of logic. And so it's really, I think this is what learning and curiosity is all about. How do I make sense of this thing? Whether that's marketing or accounting or computer science or religion. There is something that's standing between me and understanding that topic, that challenge. How do I get from here to there and make sense of that along the way? And Pame, just just to say, I mean, it's interesting you said that um, when you talk about what would a, um, a philosopher and a computer scientist, why would they have an opinion on this? It, it seems, it strikes me today that it's actually the people that are inventing the future technology are the people that most need to be involved in the philosophy of what this is going to be for for us and how it's going to affect us. I absolutely us. agree. I'm really interested as well whether, whether there's um, linkages that you can take between your sort of personal faith and interest outside of work and your, your role inside of work, uh, particularly on the learning side and, and the curiosity that you definitely bring on the inside uh, of work piece. And it seems like also on the outside. So you, do, do the two complement each other and reinforce each other? Or how, how does the sort of your curiosity play out between your, your faith and your professional role? I, I absolutely think they do. And, and again, when I talk about a lead, any leadership development program, the first thing you're taking is an assessment. What are my strengths? What do I believe? What are my values? What is my purpose? Um, when you talk about being an inclusive leader, it's helpful to know who you are as you interact with other people. And it's helpful to know that it's challenging to determine how you want to show up in the world so that you can respect that other people are doing that same work. Um, and so, you know, I, I think if you are self-aware if you are empathetic, um, all the things that you are focused. I mean, just because I respect other people's beliefs doesn't mean I have to believe everything. I can still believe what I believe and, and interact with others who are are different than me. And so certainly the lessons that I've learned in my, you know, kind of passion project have made me very thoughtful about how I want to show up in corporate spaces. I am someone who has to see connections. And so it's uh, it's it's part of what's been happening over the past, I don't know, I would say 10, 15 years for me. 
I love that, and I can see that you know, directly from my own personal experience. Where there's a, we have what we call our unbossed leadership experience within Novartis to help people to become more unbossed leaders. And there's a, a big self awareness piece, and in there, there's self reflection of sort of going back into you know, what what gives me the beliefs that I have, um, and sort of looking back into one's childhood and understanding how some of the things that we were told back in our childhood have, have shaped us and our beliefs and and so forth today. So I can see how that sort of self awareness and self reflection that maybe comes from the faith side can actually strengthen your your leadership and make you a, a more more open and aware uh, leader as well. So fantastic! Do you have a, a, a story or an example of your um, sort of your learnings being able to be put into action in a in a corporate world um, from yeah from what you you've taken from the, your faith? Boy, I mean it's it's something that happens every day, and I think I don't know if I have a specific story that I could tell you, but I will say that. So often I'm, you know, when I was walking through kind of when I talk about navigating sacred spaces, I think I say you're putting a mirror up to yourself and then you're seeing yourself in as many mirrors as you dare to look in. So Mm. every day you're being faced with a situation, you're who am I going to be right now? And certainly anytime I'm having a one on one with one of my direct reports or anytime I'm doing an appraisal or I'm having a difficult conversation, I have to decide who I'm going to be. Am I going to be empathetic? Am I going to be my best self? Or am I going to be the self that I don't necessarily like who shows up because I'm not perfect. And sometimes I get snarky and, and angry and I have to decide, is that who I'm going to be as a leader? And sometimes that's hard work. If you're learning constantly, you're constantly taking in information about how to be a really great leader. And then one day you're not going to want to be a great leader. I want to be someone who's like, just do it for the love of God. Can you just do it? Which is, you know, maybe a, 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 a style of leadership that, you know, we may have experienced in the past. And so I think that what, the, the amount of work you do to try to figure out how you want to show up as a person as a, and as a leader challenges you then in situations where you don't necessarily feel like being your best self. And then you have a moment where you think, hey, those words that are coming out of your mouth are not aligned with the person who you say you want to be. So you better course correct, reschedule, whatever you need to do, because we're going down a path that's not going to lead you to where you where you say you want to be. I imagine, Bame, um, as a curious person, <laughs> you are probably uh, curious about many, many things at the moment. But is there one thing in particular that you're really focused on uh, that you are personally most curious about at the moment? It's a great question because I really am curious about everything. I mean, I, I think we are now going through in various stages in the world after having been quarantined and sequestered in many ways, figuring out what, you know, you use all the words, new normal, next normal, you know, evolve, whatever words you want to use, what is, what are we going to look like? Um, a, what's the path of this uh, pandemic? You know, in the U.S., you may think, oh, you know, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Depending on where you are in the world, you might be saying, no, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. We're still in the tunnel. And so I'm curious about kind of how the next year is going to play out um, and how humanity will continue to interact, having had this really disruptive experience and, and in some ways very sad and very uh, just drenched in grief. And, and how are we going to emerge on the other side? Um, I'm curious about that. Fantastic. So we're uh, we're nearing the end, family, and we've covered uh, an amazingly rich variety of things from uh, being an entrepreneur through uh, culture and creating a culture of learning and curiosity through Ketchup, which I will, will now remember as a great name for a, for a learning and social media app, how we make time for learning um how it uh, pays off to be the lone nut and actually uh, create the uh, the community uh, and then going into things like sacred spaces in a digital world and how do we protect those spaces for, for humanity as well as how faith can actually improve our, our leadership skills and self-awareness as well from all of that uh, if there was one thing for our listeners to to take away what would be your your one message for people to take from today's conversation i'd say wow we covered a lot of ground first of all so, <laughs> Absolutely. thank you super fun I'd say the one thing is embrace learning as a superpower. Um, I like to say, let's, you know, you got to learn your way through it, whether it's something that's great or challenging. And if you think of yourself as a learner and as somebody who can um, find your way from not knowing to knowing, 
that's a superpower that can help you in your life, in your family's life, your community, your organization. It really is something that can can be um, a benefit and an asset. So that's what I would say. Fantastic. So embrace learning as a superpower. Thank you so much Amazing. for having us, Pamela. Really, you. really Thank inspiring. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you, Pamela. You. My pleasure. You've been listening to a Curious Advantage podcast. Uh, we're curious to hear from you. If you think there was something useful or valuable from this conversation, then we do encourage you to write a review for the podcast on your preferred channel saying why this was so what you've and what you've learned from it. Uh, we always appreciate hearing our listeners' thoughts and having a curious conversation. So join the conversation today at hashtag Curious Advantage. The curious Advantage book is available on Amazon worldwide. Order your copy now to further explore the seven C's model for being more curious. Subscribe today and keep exploring curiously. See you next time. Thank you for listening to the Curious Advantage podcast. The Curious Advantage book is now available to purchase on Amazon. Stay tuned for the next episode and keep exploring curiously. This podcast is produced by Aliki Palinelli and John McGinty and edited by Jill Damatak-Futter.